Hello everyone. For those of you who don't know, my name is Joshua Burley and I'm currently working as the Director of Youth Ministries here at Cornerstone Community Church. Now, if you guys have been following us for the past little while, you'll know that we have been doing a series on healing where each week we focus on a specific aspect of that broader topic. We, we started it off by just sharing how as a church, we feel like for this season right now, that we're supposed to talk about healing and we're supposed to be going and praying for the sick. Uh, but we've also talked about other topics like uh, the practical side of healing. How do we actually go out and pray for people? Um, and then even last week, Pastor Kyle talked about how the whole point of praying for people and healing ultimately is to point those people to Jesus. Now, as we've been going through this series and, and talking about healing quite a bit, I'm sure there's many of you who have become quite comfortable with this concept. Um, you, you understand it biblically and makes sense to you. And some of you have even decided to, to pray for people and, and see God do some really, really cool things. But I do understand that for some, you still struggle with this a little bit. Um, maybe there's just some fear going on, some nervousness. Um, it's still so new to you. Uh, today, I want to focus on a topic that I think could help you as I give some practical and biblical solutions to what you're feeling. But it's on a topic that I feel like has almost become controversial today. Um, and it's this idea of obedience, submitting to God, and, and just saying, yes, God, I will obey. Now, the title of my message, and uh, you might be able to see it behind me there, is uh, it's entitled, When God Says Jump. Now, this title actually comes from a phrase that we have in the English language that is often used between a boss or an authority figure and their worker, or the people underneath them. And that phrase is, when I say jump, you say how high and I feel like a lot of people they use this phrase in a in a very negative way that you know bosses who say that they're they're uh, they're being aggressive and mean and basically what the but basically what the phrase means is that when I ask you to do something you say yes and and more than just yes but yes how can I help how can I do this what can I do when I say jump you say how high and I feel like that's that describes well how God wants us to be obedient in general um, when he asks us to do things but in this case definitely when we go and pray for those who are sick when God says jump we say how high and so I want to show from scripture an example where God asks somebody to pray for somebody else and it was really really difficult for that person but I think there's a lot that we can gain together from this story so this story it takes place in Acts it's a uh, Acts 9 and we're gonna start reading from verses 10 to 19 but I do need to say that we're, we're kind of gonna hop right in the middle of the story so I need to give some context um, Acts 9 the beginning of it is actually a pretty famous story in the Bible. Some of you, I'm sure, will know this story. Uh, it's the story of Saul or Paul's conversion. So basically how the story goes is that there's a man named Saul or Paul, and he was a Jewish leader. He was a Pharisee um, during the time of the early church. Jesus had already ascended into heaven, and it's now Peter and John and, and that whole group leading the church in Jerusalem. But... After the Pharisees put Jesus on the cross, um, they expected that, that his movement would just end. All of his followers would get scared, they would hide, and it'd be over with. But what happened was basically just the opposite. After Jesus died and went back up to heaven, um, it just spread like crazy. His message and the church just grew. And that got the Pharisees and the Jewish leaders very upset. So what they started doing is people like Paul or Saul, <laughs> um, went out and started persecuting Christians. They would, they would beat them, they would put them in jail, they would even kill them because they didn't want them to spread the message of Jesus. Now, for in, in Saul's situation, 
He wasn't satisfied with just, you know, rounding up all the Christians in Jerusalem. He wanted to go further than that. And so he got permission from the Jewish leaders in Damascus, which is in Syria, to travel there, um, arrest a bunch of Christians, and, and then deal with them. And so he, he got the permission and he went on his way. He had his horses, his supplies, his, his assistance. But when they were on the road to Damascus, this bright light shone in the sky and it like knocked Saul off his horse and he went blind. But the light was actually, it was Jesus. And Jesus came to talk to Saul and tell him how Saul wasn't just hurting Christians when he was persecuting them. He was hurting himself, Jesus, God. And, and Jesus began to explain to him that he is God. And it was a moment that really, as we'll see later, it really, really impacted Saul. But when the light left, Saul realized that I'm still blind. I can't see. And so he had his, his helpers sort of uh, lead him uh, all the way to Damascus. And we actually see right in verse 9 that he spent like three days just without food or water um, fasting because that's how much this moment impacted him. Now, our story, we pick up in Acts 9, verse 10. And I'm going to read uh, verse 10 to 12 for now. So, the Bible says, Now there was a disciple at Damascus named Ananias. And the Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias. And he said, Here I am, Lord. And the Lord said to him, Rise and go to the street called Straight, and at the house of Judas, look for a man of Tarsus named Saul. For behold, he is praying, and he has seen a vision of a man named Ananias to come in, lay his hands on him, so that he will regain his sight. So, in this passage, we meet a man named Ananias. And the first thing that I think is super interesting about this story is right from the beginning, we find out that Ananias is a follower of Jesus who lives in Damascus. The reason why this is important is because that was the very type of person that Saul was going to Damascus to arrest. Uh, and Ananias would have definitely been a target for Saul. And here God is choosing that very person to be the one to, to pray for this man. So already we know there's going to be some tension here. Um, but other than that, the, the interesting thing about this part is, is God is sharing this with Ananias in a vision. And though maybe God doesn't speak to you in, in visions and things like that today, God still asks us to pray for the sick today. Sometimes even so specific that we know who the person is or even what the illness is, like what uh, God did for Ananias. He told him it was Saul from Tarsus, he told him where he was living, and he told him the, the illness, that he, he was blind. And God still does that today. I don't know if you've ever maybe been in the grocery store, and there's somebody in the same aisle as you, or, or just around the corner, and you see that they're limping. And maybe there's this thought that comes into your head, like, I should pray for that person. Th that's God. That's God letting you know, do it. Do it. Be obedient. Pray. Um, another good example of this, though, is us as a church, right? For whatever reason, and um, God has decided to ask us for this season to pray for those who are sick. God asks us to do these things. And um, as we'll learn later on, when he says so, like, we need to be obedient to that. We need to follow what he says. And so God is asking Ananias to go pray for Paul. And in Acts 9, verses 13 to 14, we get to see Ananias' response. So uh, Ananias says, Lord, I have heard from many about this man, how much evil he has done to your saints in Jerusalem. And here he has the authority from the chief priest to bind all who call on your name. So here we see Ananias knew who Paul was. And he knew the reason why he was in Damascus. And, and there was this real fear and this real tension for Ananias. Um, I, I, as, I was, as I was thinking about this uh, story, I was trying to come to a sort of modern comparison. I think that Ananias going to pray for Saul in that time would be like the equivalent of God asking us to go pray for an ISIS member who's blind or somebody maybe from Boko Haram, these terrorist organizations. And 
that would be scary. <laughs> I, I feel like we'd all be, have at least a little bit of fear. Um, and I know that it's not that extreme, but I, I know that there's times where you feel like you're supposed to pray for somebody or, or do something that God is asking you to do. And you're, you're afraid, maybe not afraid that you're going to die, but afraid that, um, what, what are people going to think of me? Uh, people are going to make fun of me. People are going to lash out, get angry at me. So there can be some real fears when we feel like we're supposed to pray for people. Um, but one thing that I think is so interesting about Ananias's response, you know, him sort of complaining and saying, yeah, but God, Saul is like killing Christians. Why are you asking me to do this? Is that wasn't even how God described Paul in, in the vision. Um, yes, yes, Saul had, had been going around and, and persecuting Christians, but when God was describing him, to Ananias in, in the verses 10 to 12 that I read, the first chunk there. That's not, what, that's not what God says. God tells Ananias, you need to find the man from Tarsus, Saul, and behold, he is praying. God didn't describe him as some angry, aggressive individual. He described him as a man who is praying. But see, Ananias was so focused on the fear, the tension of the situation, the fact that he would pray for somebody who has hurt many of his friends, probably, that he wasn't even listening to God. The fact that God was basically telling Ananias, listen, I know that he's done some bad things, but at this very moment, he is praying to me right now. And I feel like that's that can happen in our lives sometimes too. God asks us to do something and we're so focused on us, on our issues, on our excuses, on our fear that we're not even listening to what God's saying. We don't even realize that God has already paved a way for us in this plan that he has. So when God starts to speak to us, for instance, you know, asking us as a church to begin to pray for those who are sick, we got to be focused on that and, 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 and again, be obedient. Um, and yes, there, there can be fear. <laughs> I feel like if anybody had the right to be afraid, it'd be Ananias praying for someone like Saul. But here's the thing about fear. We, we need to fear God more than we fear the consequences of praying for somebody. Now, if you're, if you're maybe a little bit more new to faith, that term fear of God might be a little bit weird for you. Josh, what do you mean? I thought God was supposed to be loving and caring and compassionate and, and, and that we're supposed to love him back. What do you mean fear God? Well, basically a, a good definition of uh, fear of God is all it is, it's a reverent awe and respect of God and a healthy fear of, of God's displeasure and discipline. God is loving, but he's also just, and he punishes those who disobey like any good father would. And he does it still in a loving way, but it's still with truth and, 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 and injustice. So we, we need to have a healthy fear of what could happen if we don't pray for these people, as opposed to what could happen and fear the things that could happen when we do pray for these people, because God loves us so very much, but we need to honor him with our obedience and respect him with our actions um, and do the things that he is asking us to do, despite any sort of fear that we may have. So the story continues in Acts 9, 15 to 17a. Uh, it's God's response to Ananias' complaint, basically. God says, go, for he is a chosen instrument of mine to carry my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. For I will show him how much he must suffer for the sake of my name. So Ananias departed and went to the house. So Ananias had a little bit of hesitation there, right? He was afraid, but he still followed through. Ultimately, I believe that when God tells us to do something, he expects zero hesitation, right? When God says jump, we say how high. We, we, should, we should be willing and wanting to be obedient. But the thing is too, 
God is gracious and he will forgive our moments of, uh, of hesitation and, and disobedience. I don't want this message, well, I want this message to be challenging. But I don't want this message to, to bring guilt and shame back from years and years from the past when you maybe didn't do what God wanted you to do. If, if we're disobedient, God forgives that. And then we can just move on and take steps, baby steps even, towards living lives full of obedience, praying for the sick and, and doing God's work when he asks us to do it. Because the reality is our disobedience is a sin to God. James 4.17 says, whoever knows the right thing to do and fails to do it, for him it is sin. If we have been disobedient, we need to repent. We need to ask God for forgiveness, but then take the necessary steps and uh, uh, move towards obedience. And God will forgive us every time, but that's not an excuse to just continue to live and disobedience. Another great passage that goes along with this is John 14, 15. Uh, and in this just short passage, it's Jesus speaking to his followers, which includes us. And he says, if you love me, you will obey my commandments. Our love to God is linked to our obedience to him. And I'm not saying that if you have disobeyed to God, you just don't love God anymore. No, what I'm saying is that um, you should always be working towards obedience that even if you mess up you make a commitment to say you know what i messed up here god forgive me but i will make a commitment to be obedient the next time because god i love you and i know that you love me because he cares so much about us so god god tells him to go and ananias goes to the house that paul is staying in and in acts 9 17 b to 19 we see what ananias did the Bible says, in laying his hands on Saul, Ananias said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road by which you came has sent me so that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And immediately something like scales fell from his eyes and he regained his sight. Then he rose, was baptized, and taking food, he was strengthened. What we see in our situations may not be what God sees. I think it's so interesting that of all the illnesses um, Paul could have had, he was blind. Ananias went to Paul's house to pray for his blindness, but Ananias was blind too. You see, Ananias was blind to the plans that God had for Paul. All he could see was a murderer. All he could see was this really scary individual who doesn't deserve my prayers, doesn't deserve God's healing, doesn't deserve God's salvation even. That's all that he could see. And so when he prayed for Paul, I think that God healed Paul of his blindness, but he might have also healed Ananias of his blindness too. And we got to be so careful that we don't become blind to the plans of God that are happening in our own lives. It's not just about us. It's not just about Ananias. It's about Paul, too, and the work that will continue from there. So um, what we see may not be what God sees. I mean, when we, look, when we look at the story of Paul, yes, he started out in a very rough spot. But even right after this moment of Ananias pr praying for him, Paul went on to become one of the greatest evangelists, theologians, missionaries that we as Christians have ever had. He became an incredible leader of the church and it all started in this simple moment of obedience with Ananias despite the fears that he had. He just did it and God honored that and, and, and used Paul mightily for his kingdom. And the thing is that Paul was healed but so much more happened in his life. We can see right from this passage that Yes, Paul was healed, but it also says that he was baptized in water, which means that sometime from his uh, Damascus Road experience to that prayer, he gave his life to Jesus. So he was healed, he was saved, he was baptized in water. And then a lot of people also believe actually that this prayer, this moment, was the time when Paul got baptized in the Holy Spirit 
as well. So this one prayer of Ananias, when he, when he decided to be obedient, turned into this beautiful uh, spiritual moment for Paul that, that impacted the rest of his life and his, his ministry. Now, I want to make sure that I'm clear as we come closer to the end of my, my talk that, uh, and this goes for anything that God asks us to do, but we need to stop seeing the work of God that he's asking us to do and, and being obedient to him as burdens. It's not a burden to be obedient to God. It's not a burden to pray for the sick. It's a privilege. It's a blessing. And it leads to incredible opportunities that God has chosen for us. God doesn't need us. He doesn't need us. But he's chosen to use us as willing vessels. And that is something that needs to be celebrated, that we need to get excited about, and not dread or take for granted. God doesn't need us, but he chooses to use us. And that is, I think, a beautiful, beautiful thing. So will we be obedient? Are we willing to say yes to God? When God says jump, are we willing to say how high? And I know that it takes baby steps. I'm not asking anybody to go from being in in complete disobedience to complete obedience. I I, I get it. I still hesitate today. Um, Even a couple days ago, as I was writing this message, I had a moment of hesitation when God was asking me to do something. So we're all working on this together. Um, But I think as long as we're taking those steps, that God honors that. So I want to give us some practical things that we can do when it comes to being obedient in praying for the sick. And I guess just being obedient in general uh, of what we can do so that we can can follow through with that. The first thing that I will say is um, when we're struggling, when we're feeling like we're going to hesitate, I'd encourage you to start asking some of these questions. Why, why wouldn't I do this? You know, why wouldn't I pray for this person? Maybe you could ask yourself, honestly, what's the worst thing that can happen? <laughs> Ananias was fearing for his life. I don't know if there's a situation, a common situation, where we find ourselves praying for somebody at the risk of our own lives. What's the worst that could happen? Maybe we can ask ourselves, what's the best thing that could happen, right? Ananias, for him, the worst thing, death. The best thing, which I think is the thing that happened, was Paul gets healed, he gets saved, he gets baptized, and he gets baptized in the Holy Spirit, um, and God uses him mightily for his kingdom. Think about what the best thing that could happen could be. And then the last question is just, do I really doubt God this much? Because the thing is, if God is asking us to do something, even though it's us being obedient, he's going to be with us the whole time. And do we really not trust God enough to say that if I say yes, he's just He's just going to ditch me? No, he, he's going to be with us the, the whole time. So feel free to ask yourself those questions. Um, but another thing that we could do is pray for opportunities. The thing is, we... Um, if we start actually asking God for opportunities to be obedient, that automatically makes us more accountable to obey. Because it's way it's way easier to obey something that you asked for than something that's just piled on your lap, right? And so if we ask God, God, would you give me an opportunity? When it presents itself, you recognize that this is God answering your prayer. And then, you, you know, you, you want to obey it more, I think. And alongside of that, I will say, when you pray for opportunities, pray for the boldness to follow through with those opportunities. Because we can be so bold when, we, when we're in prayer, praying for those opportunities, but the moment they present themselves, sometimes we can become a very different person from when we were praying for them to when they present themselves. There, there could be fear that arises and, and, and affects our obedience. So, Pray for opportunities, but pray for the boldness to follow through with those opportunities. The uh, the last thing that I will say practically here is when you feel like God is asking you to do something and and you want to be obedient, say it. Say it out loud. If God is telling you something, maybe it's in your mind, it's a thought that just pops into your head, 
go pray for that lady at the grocery store. Say it out loud. God, I will obey. God, I will obey. If there's somebody with you, tell them about it. Say, hey, listen, can you, I want to go pray for that person. Can you keep me accountable? Can you physically push me towards them if I stop? Right? Sometimes we need that amount of accountability when we're just starting out, you know, to be obedient. So say it out loud because if we keep the the commands of God just in our head, it can be very easy to just dismiss them, to just push, push them away, think of a different thought, start singing a song so you get it out of your head. But if we bring it from our brain to our mouth, I think it raises the level of accountability so much higher. And you've actually said it out loud now. So now I got to do it. So if God is asking you to do something, just say it. God, I will obey. And then the last thing is just do it. Try it. See what happens. Maybe experience some humiliation so you know that it's not actually that bad. And then you get more comfortable and you don't care how many people laugh at you because, ah, that's old news. Try something new. I'm praying for Jesus. I'm being obedient right now. Um, So try those things. And and if you have any questions, feel free to send me some. I would love to, because again, you know, I, I still have my own struggles and we can work at this together to be obedient as a church and do what God is asking us to do. Pray for the sick and see some people get healed. And the last thing I want to say, actually, is I want to take this moment to be obedient myself. Um, some of you may remember uh, when I spoke two weeks ago about, um, about the authority that we have in Jesus to pray for the sick and, and learning that from the Bible. And at the very end, I, I said a prayer about certain issues that I believe that God wanted to heal. In that case, it was it was lower back and Actually, we had three, at least three people get healed during that time. And I can only give glory to God for that. Um, But again, I want to be obedient. And I feel like as I was prepping for this message, God gave me another word. And so I'm going to pray, but I want to explain who I'm going to be praying for. So the first group of people that I'm going to be praying for is if you're blind. And I, I think it's so, I didn't plan this. Obviously, God did that. I talked about a story um, about blindness and, and now I'm praying for it. So if you are blind and you're listening to this, you, f- you find yourself listening to this, um, I want to pray for you. And there was actually a message that kind of came with me praying for somebody who's blind, was that I believe that whoever this person is, they've counted themselves out. They, they disqualified themselves from ever being healed. They, they, looked at, uh, they, they, they thought about how maybe other people are getting healed. They, they've heard stories. Um, they even, you know, maybe heard us talking about this series. And for them, they thought, oh, there's no way that I'll be able to see again. God doesn't want to heal me of that. It's, it's too big of a deal. Or he, he doesn't actually care that much about my, my eyes and my, my body. But I feel so confidently that somebody is going to get healed of blindness and they're going to be able to see for the first time, maybe in a very, very long time. I do want to say this as well. If nobody who's blind is listening to this, I do feel like then there's somebody who's watching this who isn't blind but knows somebody who's blind. And since this since this series has started, uh, you you counted these people out. You know that we've had prayer times and prayer meetings, and and you could send it, request it at any time. But you felt, ah, oh, God's not going to do that. He doesn't do those kinds of things. He. Um, what, what if it doesn't happen, right? All these worries and doubts and questions. And I believe that God's going to heal that person in your life. So as I'm praying, would you pray with me? And, um, and whether you are blind yourself or it's another person who knows someone who's blind, test it out or get the person to test it out. Uh, open your eyes, take off your, your sunglasses and look around um, and see if God has, has touched your eyes. And then let us know. I would love to hear this testimony, be encouraged by it myself, but we would love to share that with everybody else because um, that's something to celebrate. The second group of people that I want to pray for is, first of all, um, people with people who have suffered strokes recently, and it's really damaged uh, their body. 
So I'm going to pray for that in general, but there's either one person or a couple people who have this specific situation. You recently had a stroke and it affected the left side of your body like badly to the point where you actually, you, you yourself can't really see out of that eye that well. Um, your hearing has actually really been affected and it's gone all the way down to affect your left leg where it's really hard actually for you to walk. Um, again, I, I know that's super specific, but I believe that that's for somebody and somebody is going to get healed from the consequences of that stroke. So again, if that's you test it out, if your leg doesn't really work that well, take a lap, see how it feels. If, if you can't see that well, maybe cover your good eye and see if the, the other one, um, is working better. Maybe s do a couple snaps in front of your ear, uh, to see if you can hear better. And again, let us know. We, we, we really do enjoy hearing uh, all, the, all the times that God heals people. So I'm going to pray for those things. Pray along with me. And we'd love to hear and see um, what God has done. So Jesus, I thank you for this, this opportunity, Lord. I thank you for your word, God, and this message today, Lord. Um, God, would you help us all? God, I know that we all at times fall short. We struggle with hesitation, with fear, with disobedience. God, would you forgive us? And will we take the necessary steps to walk in obedience? And God, I want to be obedient today as well. And so God, I pray right now, if there's anybody listening to this who is blind, I pray even right now as I am praying, God, that they would begin to open their eyes and, uh, and see for the very first time in a long time. God, I'm even imagining if they don't even have eyes anymore, Lord, that you, would, you are powerful enough to just grow them back. And, and the person would be able to see, God, no one should count themselves out from a healing from you. And I pray that they wouldn't. I pray that faith would rise up in these people. And they take it seriously and know, God, that they will see again. Um, if it wasn't that, but uh, a person who can see, but knows someone who's blind, Lord, would you give them the faith to pray for this person and then call them and expect in faith that that person is going to be healed. But would you heal that blind person or people in their life, God? And also, Lord, I just want to pray for those who have had strokes recently, God. Um, I know that sometimes that can uh, do a number on your body afterwards. And I just pray for healing and uh, restoration in their body. But God, I do also pray for this specific person or people. Lord, this person who has, um, who's been really affected on the left side of their body to the point where they can't really see, hear, or walk on that side. God, I pray even right now as they begin to stand up that they'd already notice a difference. All of a sudden, all their senses would just come back in an instant and in some ways it would almost overwhelm them because they could hear and see and walk again. God, we ask that you would heal them. And God, as we go from here, would you continue to bless these, this series, the, the times of healing that we're having on Wednesdays and all the random moments of healing that come in between, God? Would we be obedient? And we pray for those who are sick so that they can be healed, but just like what Pastor Kyle talked about last week, so that if they don't know you, God, they can come to know you deeply, uh, forgiven of their sins and walking, taking steps towards you, God. So I thank you again for this opportunity, Jesus. And I, pr I God, I, I look forward to all the stories that we're going to hear in the future of, of the mighty, mighty work that you have done, Jesus. In your powerful healing name, Jesus, we pray. Amen.